Hello everyone, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about osmosis. So let's just start off by looking at these lovely plants. And the question is asking, what do you think the difference is between these two plants and why do you think this is? Well, what do we notice about them? This one is all lovely and upright, and this one is all fallen down. And why might it have fallen down? It's fallen down because it doesn't have enough water. So when a plant doesn't have enough water in its stem and in its xylems and in its leaves, it wilts. So this plant has wilted. So water is really essential to plants to enable them to stay upright, which is really important because it allows their leaves to lie flat and broad so they can face the sunlight and they can receive the maximum amount of sunlight possible so they can do the most photosynthesis and we know that photosynthesis gives plants glucose and they then use that glucose in respiration to provide energy for growth. So water is really important to plants to enable them to stay upright. In this session we're going to be talking about what osmosis is. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high water concentration. And another term for high water concentration is a dilute solution. So you could either say osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high water concentration, or you could say osmosis is the movement of water from a dilute solution, okay, to an area of low water concentration or a more concentrated solution across a partially permeable membrane down the water concentration gradient. This is a passive process. It does not require energy from respiration. So there's a few key things that we need to pick up on here. So the first thing is, what do we mean by high and low water concentration? Well, we know that solutions are made up of two things. Solutions are made up of a solute and a solvent, and a solute is the thing that is dissolved, and the solvent is the thing in this, in which the solute is dissolved. So for instance, in our case, we're gonna say the solvent is water, and anything which is dissolved in water, so we could give some examples. So for example, sugar or salt. These could be things that make up the solute. So when you've got a solution that has a set volume or a set mass of water and in one of those solutions you've got just a few sugar particles dissolved compared to another solution in which you've got lots and lots of sugar particles dissolved. This one is a more concentrated solution or has a lower water concentration. What do we mean by a partially permeable membrane? Well, what we're really referring to here is the cell membrane. And we know that the cell membrane will allow some things to travel across and not others. So cell membranes allow water to move across and they also allow small soluble molecules to move across, but not large molecules. That's why we call them partially permeable, because they're permeable to some things, but not others. Let's just check we understand this word gradient. The word gradient means when there is a higher concentration on one side than the other. So if we imagine that this was our membrane here, if we had a um, higher water concentration on this side and a lower water concentration on this side, the concentration gradient would be in this direction and water would move in this direction. Now let's just think about this. This is a passive process, i.e. does not require energy from respiration. Well, we know that energy is released in the process of respiration in the form of ATP. So when we do processes that require ATP, we say we need to do respiration in order for those processes to occur because they require energy. That doesn't mean that it doesn't need any energy at all. So it doesn't take energy from respiration, so it's passive, but it does require energy. So molecules need energy in order to move around at all. And these water molecules are moving around. And so they have kinetic energy. The kinetic energy enables them to move. And the amount of kinetic energy that they have determines how much that they move. So if we were to increase the temperature 
of a solution, we would increase the kinetic energy that the molecules would have within that solution. And therefore, we would increase the rate of osmosis, the rate at which water molecules were moving in a particular direction. So we've covered this term concentration gradient, we've covered the term partially permeable membrane, and we've covered the term passive process. We've also introduced one factor which would affect the rate of osmosis, and that factor is temperature. So as you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, and therefore you increase the rate of osmosis. Molecules will move faster down their concentration gradient. So let's just talk about some other factors that will affect the rate of osmosis other than the temperature. The second factor that we're going to talk about is the concentration gradient, i.e. the difference between one side and the other. The greater the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of osmosis. So the greater the difference between one side and another, the faster the rate at which water molecules will move from that area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. The third thing that will affect the rate of osmosis is the surface area to volume ratio, i.e. how much edge there is. Because we can kind of think of the edges of cells, so the cell membrane, as like the doors. And the more edges there are, the more doors there are for the water to move through, so the more water can leave. So the greater the surface area to volume ratio, the greater the rate of osmosis. So let's just imagine for a moment that an animal cell is put in a beaker of pure water. In this circumstance, the highest water concentration is going to be outside the cell and there's going to be a lower water concentration inside the cell. And we know this because inside the cell we've got the cytoplasm and there are many things dissolved in the cytoplasm. So that's going to lower the water concentration of the inside of the cell. So as a result of this, water will start to move into the cell. So water will enter the cell down its concentration gradient. Now this will cause the cell to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the animal cell has no way to cope with this. Imagine that you were blowing air into a balloon and if you kept blowing air into that balloon, what would happen? The balloon would burst. And that is exactly what happens to the animal cell. The animal cell will eventually burst. Now, the fancy name that we say for when cells burst, like this, when animal cells burst, is lysis. Now, if this was a red blood cell, we would say hemolysis. Now, we obviously don't want this to happen. This is why our body works so hard to maintain the concentration of our blood and to maintain the concentration of our tissue fluids so that our cells don't burst and also so they don't shrivel. So at this point, I'm going to introduce you to another key term. I'm going to introduce you to the term hypotonic. Now, hypotonic is when the concentration of the solute in the solution outside the cell is higher than the internal concentration of the cell, which is exactly what we see here. When we put this animal cell in pure water, we were putting it into a hypotonic solution. So now let's imagine a slightly different circumstance. Now, now let's imagine that we take our animal cell and we place it in a solution that is highly concentrated. We call solutions that are more concentrated than the cell hypertonic solutions. So in this situation, you can see you've got a highly concentrated salt solution that our water is in, and there is a lower water concentration outside the cell in comparison to inside the cell. What direction is the water going to move this time? Well, in this situation, the water is going to leave the cell. So the water moves by osmosis, down its water concentration gradient from the inside of the cell to the solution. What effect is this going to have on the cell? Well, the cell is going to lose water. It's going to lose volume. The cell is going to shrivel up. So we can see that our cell has shriveled up and we say that it has a crenated. So it has shriveled up. So you could just say the cell shrivels. Or if you wanted the fancy word, you could say crenation. So we're going to talk about one more scenario. 
we're going to talk about a scenario in which we put our animal cell into a solution that is of equal water concentration. So the water concentration inside the cell and outside the cell is equal. In this situation, we say that the solution is isotonic. When the solution is isotonic and there is an equal water concentration both outside the cell in comparison to inside the cell, there is an equal movement of water in both directions. So water moves equally out and in. So there is no overall change in the volume of water in the cell and the cell stays the same size. This is what your body is trying to achieve all the time. Now this works a little bit differently in plant cells. So let's take a minute to talk about plant cells. So let's imagine that we took a plant cell and we placed it in a beaker of pure water. So we've placed our plant cell in a hypotonic solution where the concentration of the solute outside the cell is less than the internal concentration of the cell. And there is a higher water concentration outside the cell in comparison to inside. In what direction is the water going to move? The water is going to move into the cell by osmosis, down its water concentration gradient across the partially permeable membrane. Remember, the cell wall is fully permeable. So the cell wall is not in any way affecting the rate of osmosis. However, the plant cell will behave very differently to the animal cell in this case, because as the cell expands, the cell membrane will start to push on the cell wall. When the cell membrane starts to push on the cell wall, the cell wall will push back. It will create an equal and opposite pressure. The role of the plant cell wall in this case is to prevent the cell from bursting. The cell swells and we say that the cell becomes turgid. So the cell membrane pushes on the cell wall. The cell becomes turgid. It is upright. This is really important for plants because plants don't have bones. Okay, They can't keep themselves upright in other ways. They rely on this turga pressure. They rely on water to keep themselves upright. Now let's imagine another situation. Let's imagine that we were to take this plant cell and we were to put it in a hypertonic solution. What do you think would happen then? So here we can see our plant cell in this highly concentrated salt solution um, and in this case what direction is the water going to move? Well the water is going to leave the plant cell, the water is going to move by osmosis down its concentration gradient from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell until it reaches equilibrium. However the cell's not going to shrivel up in the same way as the animal cell did. What is going to happen? As water leaves the plant cell, the cell membrane will start to pull away from the cell wall. As it pulls away from the cell wall, the cell wall will maintain the shape of the cell, but the cell membrane will no longer be exerting any pressure on the cell wall. And so the cell membrane starts to pull away. At the point where the cell membrane is no longer pushing on the cell wall, we say the cell is flaccid. At the point where the cell membrane is completely pulled away from the cell wall, we say that the cell is plasmalized. Okay, so I've just introduced you to lots and lots of new key terms. So we've had the word plasmalized, flaccid, turgid, isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic, lots and lots of new terms. So I need to make sure that you can understand and remember what each of these terms means. So just take a look at these three images of plant cells. So we can see in the first one, the cell has become plasmalized. What do you see in the other two? Can you describe what a plant cell would do if it found itself in an isotonic solution?
Just imagine a situation where a student takes some cubes of potato. So she's going to take some cubes of potato and she's going to ensure that each of these cubes of potato have the same initial volume. So they are each, each a cube and each side of each cube is two centimetres wide. So each cube has the same surface area to volume ratio. And she's going to place each of these cubes into a different solution of sucrose. So different concentrations of a sucrose solution. So in this experiment, the student is trying to determine how much water enters or leaves the, the cells of the um, what do I say it was? Potato. Let's go with potato. Enter or leave the cells of the potato. And she'll do that by determining how the mass of the potato changes. So at the very beginning, she would measure the, the initial mass of each cube. Over the course of the hour, water will either enter the potato cube or leave the potato cube, depending on in which direction the concentration gradient is. Just take a minute to guess in which cubes you think water will enter and in which cubes you think water will leave. At the end of the hour, the student then measured the mass of each cube. And then she recorded the percentage change in mass. How would you calculate percentage change in mass? In order to calculate percentage change in mass, you would divide the change in mass by the initial mass and multiply your answer by 100. For instance, if at the end of the hour, one of the cubes had an increase in mass of 0 0.3 grams and the initial mass was 4.5 grams, you would do 0 0.3 divided by 4.5 and then you would times that by 100. Oh. And then that would tell you that you would have an increase in mass of 7%. So let's just take a look at these experimental setups. Can we identify the independent variable, the dependent variable, and the control variables? Well, remember the dependent variable is the thing that you measure, and you are measuring the change in mass, and then you are using that to calculate the percentage change in mass. What's the independent variable? The independent variable is the thing that you are changing. So the independent variable is the concentration of the sucrose solution. And what are the control variables? The control variables are the things that you keep the same. So for instance, the first thing is the initial surface area to volume ratio. The second thing is the volume of the sucrose solution in each of our beakers. The third thing is the time that they are left for. So after the student did this, she gathered all of her data and she um, collated it into a results table and then she plotted a graph. Let's have a look at the sort of graph that you would plot. And what did she find? She found that at zero percentage sucrose solution, so in pure water, her um, potato cubes gained a large volume of water. And so they had a high percentage increase in mass. And then at 20%, they still gained water, but a bit less. And then at 40%, they seemed to lose a little bit of water. And at 60%, they lost a little bit more. And 80%, they lost a little bit more. And then then what did she do next? The next thing she did was she drew a line of best fit through her data. When you draw your line of best fit, it's really important that you don't go beyond your first or last point. What can we determine from this? So here we can determine that when the um, 
potato cube was placed in pure water, water entered down its concentration gradient and the potato gained mass. Whereas at a certain point here, what's this? This point on the graph, let's say this is about 38%. Um, the solution is isotonic. And our potato cube is neither gaining or losing water. What sort of correlation is this? What we are looking at here is a negative correlation. This means that as you increase one factor, we decrease another. So let's just have a go at a little maths question about this. Imagine you were trying to work out how much water that a plant or potato cube or whatever it was, was absorbing over a period of time. So let's imagine that a plant absorbed about two and a half litres of water in a 12 hour period. So a plant absorbed two and a half litres of water in a 12 hour period. Calculate the rate of water absorption in centimetres cubed per minute. So there's a couple of key things we have to notice in a question like this. So we are converting litres into centimetres cubed and we're converting hours into minutes. When you see a question like this, it's really important that you take note of the units so that you don't make a mistake. So where would we start? The first thing we'd need to do is calculate how many minutes are in 12 hours. So we would just do 12 times 60. And then we'd need to convert the units to the units that we need to express in your answer. So how many centimetres cubed in two and a half litres? Two and a half litres is 2,500 centimetres cubed. And 12 hours is 720 minutes. And the next thing that you would do is you would divide the volume of water absorbed by the time that it was absorbed in. So 2,500 divided by 720. So that would tell us that we would have been absorbing about 3.472 centimetres cubed per minute over the two and a half hour period on average. Okay, so in this video, we have looked generally at what osmosis is. We learned the definition for osmosis. We have looked at how animal and plant cells behave differently in different solutions. We've looked at how we might carry out an investigation into osmosis using potato cubes. We've talked about uh, independent variables, dependent variables and control variables and how we might plot a graph of that data. We've also had a look at a couple of math skills. So I hope you found this session useful and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to make sure that you've got some detailed notes on this topic and make sure you understand each of the key points. We will be applying this knowledge in our next lesson. But well done for listening and thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.